Okay, so let's uh, start with a couple of examples here. Now that we've seen the dividend regimes and we've talked about how to, uh, to value them, uh, of course, I think the easiest way to understand these is to just start working some of these by hand, get a feel for what this looks like. So we'll work as a couple of zero growth examples, uh, or, or in other words, constant uh, dividend regime examples. Uh, then, uh, then come back to me. Now the dividend growth model, as you've seen in the uh, example that we worked, is, uh, is simply the uh, growing perpetuity model where we've changed the, the cash flows to specifically represent the dividend. And so we can say that the price of at any time zero is equal to the next period's dividend divided by the discount rate minus the growth rate. Right? And here in this formula, I've also given you the way to move from, uh, to uh, estimate the growth of a dividend from one period to the next. So that if you're given a dividend in the last period, you know how to calculate the dividend in the next period, which is to multiply it by one plus the growth rate. Okay. So this is the model you're going to use. It's on the formula sheet for the exams. It's, of course, sprinkled throughout all of the examples that we're going to work. Uh, and we call it the dividend growth model. But in reality, the dividend growth model is just the growing perpetuity model that we learned in Chapter 6. Just has uh, a, some new flavor on it, some new context. Now, one of the things that we want to be careful of when we're using a model like this is that we're making a lot of assumptions and those assumptions about the future are always going to be wrong. Right? So one thing that I'll always tell you in this class and about predictions about the future is that when you try to predict the future, you're always wrong. You're always wrong. You're always wrong. And even when you're right, you were still wrong. You were just lucky. Okay? And that holds particularly true when we're talking about things like investing in the stock market. Okay? So we'll do some more talking about that too. But when we have a model like this, we're making a lot of assumptions. We're making assumptions about the dividend that's being paid. We're making assumptions about the growth rate in the dividends, whether there is one and whether it's constant. And we're making assumptions about the discount rate, the R, and whether that is also constant and because it's assumed to be the same forever. And what this graph here is showing you is the sensitivity of the model to one of those assumptions, which is namely that the growth rate in the dividend is the same and it's the same forever. And so what I want to show you is just how sensitive stock price can be to our assumption about the growth rate in dividends. Because remember, if I say the dividends are gonna grow at 20% a year, that means I assume they're gonna get 20% larger every year forever. And forever is a long time. And 20% is a big growth rate. Over time, you're going to end up with an enormous dividend that is just completely unfeasible. Un, un, in, in no way are, is the company able to pay something like that. So what we have to be careful with when we're making these assumptions is that we keep in mind how the assumptions affect the result. Okay? So the growth rate here down on the bottom, this is the G in a model where the dividend next period is $2 and the discount rate is 20%. So both of those are pretty reasonable. You saw Procter & Gamble's annual dividend is $3 a share. So $2 is right in line with a company like Procter & Gamble. A discount rate of 20% is right in line with a standard company in the US. But notice how different the price is when we choose different growth rates. So the growth rate in the dividends, if it's all the way down at a dollar, the price of a share should be about 10 bucks. But if it's all the way up at say 19%, so 19% growth year over year, then the price of a share should be about $200. And that's a huge swing, right? In fact, the swings get pretty big as soon as we move above a growth rate of about 10%, which is relatively reasonable to assume uh, for dividends. But of course, remember that after a thousand years, even a 10% growth rate, and a thousand years is inside of an infinite number, even a 10% growth rate after a thousand years is gonna give us dividends like two, three million dollars a year, which of course is just totally unreasonable, right? So we have to keep that in mind too, that there is absurdity in this model because we are assuming that these things go on forever. But we still need to try to make sure that our assumptions have some basis in economic reality. Okay? Otherwise, we can get even more crazy than we really intended to.
So let's jump and let's work a, an example using the dividend, a couple of examples of using the dividend growth model. Uh, talk about some of the things using the dividend growth model. Okay. As always, the, uh, the answers are in the slides here. Uh, a couple more examples. Uh, then we'll work, a, a, let's work our first example here of non-constant growth. Again, uh, I encourage you to pay attention to these examples. I, I think that they are among the most difficult that we do in this class. Uh, and they are certainly among the ones that students struggle the most with. So uh, I've got a bunch of examples uh, out there for you. Uh, I've got examples in here. Uh, so uh, we're, there are going to be examples in the homework. There's plenty of opportunity to work these kind of problems. Remember that the, the, the central goal of every single one of these is to take the present value of all the future dividends. It's just easier when the dividends have the same pattern than when they have a changing pattern. And that's what makes these non-constant growth examples more difficult. Okay. So here's a solution. Uh, we'll work a couple more questions talking about required return here. Because the required rate of return turns out to be one of the most important pieces, in, indeed, in this model or any other, uh, it's going to certainly going to be something that comes up again and again throughout the rest of the class. And we're going to talk about a few different ways to solve for R. So here I'm saying required return because that's how we're going to start to talk about it in the future. But the way that we've said it uh, throughout the beginning of this class is either as the interest rate or as the discount rate. And again, all of those terminology, all of that terminology is equivalent, which is one of the harder things about this class. I, I, I get that. Um, but it's something that we can't avoid because over time, different things have just been given different names and people have continued to use the old ones and the new ones and, uh, and all, all equivalently, and that makes it tough. Okay? But when we are often what we're interested in when we are thinking about stock prices and when we're thinking about investing is not always the price because uh, what you, of course, may have been thinking about the whole time is why do I need to have a model to give me the price of a share of stock when I can just simply go on the internet and look up the price, right? In other words, the price is usually observable. I can go into Yahoo Finance, I can search Procter & Gamble, and I can see the price. Why do I need to look at their dividends and estimate the growth rate and estimate their required rate of return and calculate my own price when the market has already done it for me? And likewise with dividends, I can look at the Procter & Gamble website and I can see the dividends, right? And so even though I can't see next period's dividend, I can't see D1, I can see last period's dividend, and I can calculate the growth rate between the dividends so there are a lot of things in this model that are observable. The price, the dividends, and the growth rate are generally at least reasonably observable for a company like Procter & Gamble. The one thing that it turns out isn't observable, the one thing that we don't know is R, the discount rate. But strangely, of course, at least in this class, R has been something that I have continually just given, just fed in the problem. The discount rate is X. The required rate of return is Y. The interest rate is Z. All of those things have been provided in the problem and they'll continue to be provided. That being said, this is the first time when we're going to talk about uh, how to solve for that directly. Right? And it's going to become a major component of the class because uh, it's going to turn out that this rate of return is quite closely tied to the risk of an investment or the risk of the stock. And so that is going to be an important component of our models going forward. So we can rearrange uh, the, the dividend growth model here so that R is on one side by itself. And that way we can solve for the required rate of return given that we have observed the dividend and the price and the growth rate of dividends. And those are usually things that we can or at least uh, we can find out if we haven't already observed. Uh, and so when we rearrange the formula, we get this result here on the bottom that says that uh, the required rate of return of the discount rate is equal to the dividend next period divided by the price this period plus the growth rate in dividends. And that first piece, D1 over P0, actually has a term. Uh, it's called the dividend yield, the dividend divided by the price. Uh, this is a ratio, financial ratio, that we haven't talked about yet. And the second piece is called the capital gain, which is simply just G, the growth rate in dividends. Okay. So let's work a couple of uh, examples here, uh, solving for the required rate of return and talking about dividend yield and capital gains. Uh, and then uh, a couple more problems. 
and uh, and and then come back. 